Coming to you live from the Soup Studios in beautiful downtown Metrodelphia, it's that Sultan of Sleuthing, that Houdini of Whodunits, Jack McCoy Private Eye. Tonight's episode, The Young and the Reckless Endangerment. Among the most memorable job offers I ever received was the time some wacko wanted to hire me to find the Fountain of Youth. There was no shortage of reasons I did not take the job, but primarily it came down to budgeting. I would have been happy to spend a few months on subtropical beach locations, diligently searching for the fountain. Unfortunately, my prospective client and I could not come to an agreement on the appropriateness of listing various rum-based beverages on the expense account. Now, the reason this case, if you can call it that, sticks in my mind isn't the question of whether there's an age-restoring fountain somewhere out there. There isn't, and that's the end of that. My question has always been, who would want such a thing? They say youth is wasted on the young, but there's no separating the two. If you get younger, so does your brain. And the thing is, young people are stupid. Oh, I'm not implying that old people aren't stupid. They're just dumb in different ways. See, if you think you've got 60 years left to live instead of 30, you tend to do things that make that 60 years more likely to turn out to be like five more minutes. The other thing is, a lot of people want to be young again because they want to go back and fix a mistake they made. Nope, that's not how the fountain works, but it is how they want it to work. And I have a general rule in life. If you're old and stupid, and your biggest wish in life is to go back to being young and stupid, I automatically don't trust you. But that might just be because you remind me of someone in particular. Relax! I once tried out for the Olympic rifle team. Almost got in, too. Uh Uh-huh. And how many cataracts ago was that? I do not have cataracts. Of course not. You just drink your milk with your eyeballs. My eyes are fine. There is way too much low-hanging fruit in that sentence. However, moving on to other business, I would like to inform you that I've turned on one of my video cameras. Why? There are some rules about recording people without their knowledge. In the course of my career, I almost always ignore those rules. But since this is my office, I figured I'd play it safe. No. Why are you recording me? You walked into my office with a fully loaded shotgun and asked me to open my window. As I understand it, your intention is to open fire at that nest of raccoons that have been opening the building's trash cans. Those masked gophers have had it too good for too long. Far be it for me to argue. The camera is only on so that when the cops show up, I can show them the photographic evidence that I am not the psycho taking pot shots out of a five-story window in the middle of the city. Nobody's gonna call the cops. Ethel, look across the street. In the windows of the building there, I have spotted no fewer than four people looking out of their window with their phones to their ears. The police are probably on their way. And both of us are likely to end up on a list somewhere, which I would rather not be on. Oh, fine. Thank you. You know, there are any number of alternatives to get rid of a raccoon infestation. Shooting them is more satisfying. Most illegal things are. Excuse me? Why, hello, sweetie. You make a wrong turn, kid? No. You selling cookies or maybe magazines for your school? No. All right, I'm out of ideas. What the heck are you doing here? I'm looking for a private detective. Oh, well, you've got the next best thing. I'll just be going. You're not going anywhere, Ethel. I am not the sort of man who's comfortable in a room with an unaccompanied minor. I need another responsible adult in the room. Why does she have a gun? For varying definitions of responsible, of course. What's your name, kid? Carrie. Nice to meet you, Carrie. Now I'm afraid you'll have to go. Huh? I don't work for anyone under 18. But you don't even know what I want to hire you for. Doesn't matter. But I need your help. That doesn't matter either, kid. I know this seems heartless, but it's for the best. There is nothing you can say that would get me to change my mind. I have $500 in cash. You 
you just sit down right over here, sweetie. Ethel. Well, we should at least hear her out. Oh, boy. All right, it's probably a waste of time, but sure. Tell me what you want, Carrie. My dad got arrested last night. They say he killed someone, but he didn't. I want you to prove he's innocent. Last night? Gary, what's your last name? Capaldi. Which makes your father Smitty Capaldi. How did you know? I'm one of those dinosaurs who reads the newspaper. I read about your father this morning. That's rough. Nevertheless, now that you've told me a story, I can't help you even more. What are you talking about? Her father was arrested within a few minutes of the murder, which means this is still being actively investigated. Cops, as a general rule, have a strict don't-stick-your-nose-in-my-active-crime-scene policy. And that's only reason number one. Why else? Because the murder victim in this case is Sal Toscani, who is what you might call a maid man. He's a man in a maid's outfit? No, Ethel, he's in the mafia. Do they wear maid's outfits? Statistically, I'm sure some of them do. Who am I to judge? But the point is, the mob has this thing where if they think someone killed one of their guys, they don't care for private detectives coming around and convincing the cops to let that someone walk free. They're funny that way. I don't care about that. Look, they're going to put me in a foster home, and Dad's going to prison unless you help me. I am guessing that's an envelope full of $500, which I absolutely do not want to know how you got. But the answer is no, kid. Maybe I could pull some strings with the cops. Maybe I know a friend of a friend who might keep organized crime from disorganizing my internal organs. But even if I was willing to call in that many favors for a mere $500, there's the matter of the paperwork. What? Every client I work with signs a contract with me doesn't keep me alive, and it won't protect me if I do anything illegal, but it keeps me from losing my license if someone asks why I'm sticking my neck out. You, however, are a minor and are not able to legally enter into a contract. I know this makes me seem like a heartless son of a... Jack! ...gun, but I can't take a risk like that. Me going to jail and losing my license means I don't help you or anyone else ever again. May I see that envelope for a second, dearie? Thank you. Jack, here's $500. I want to hire you to find out who really killed Hal Toposki. If she'd gotten the name right, it would have been a touching display of humanity for someone I didn't exactly think was qualified. Before you give it too much credit, though, remember the raccoons and the attempted reckless discharge of a firearm. In any case, I was in it, but good now. I had to solve a murder case, which isn't something a private detective normally does. Since I had just a hair more than buckus to go on, I found myself in desperate need of help from a person I generally don't want to need help from. No, detective, there's no need for that tone. A disinterested no is probably the best tone you're going to get out of me, Sergeant O'Hanlon. Oh, come on. Give him a chance. We've lost count of the number of times Jack McCoy was indispensable in solving a case before us. That would be impressive if you didn't need to take your shoes off to count past ten. Mr. McCoy? Yes? Who are you working for? An interested party has hired me on behalf of Mr. Capaldi's daughter. Ultimately, I'm working for Carrie's best interest which in this case means trying to prove her father is innocent. Oh, that poor wee child. Show her the picture, Jack. Not the worst idea you've ever had, O'Hanlon. Detective? You told this child to look as pathetic as possible before you took this picture, in the hopes that I'd take pity on her, didn't you? I am by no means above such an action, but in this case, she doesn't look much more desperate than she would have if I hadn't said anything. This kid lost the only family she has, and she needs him home safe and sound. You do understand how much the DA wants me to give out information about this case to the lead suspect's family, don't you? I have a sense. But 
if you'll just look at the photo again. I hate you both. Fine, I will give you the Cliff Notes version of the case, and I'm leaving out some extremely important details on purpose. Capiche? I appreciate anything you can do. Shut up. All right, look. Sal Toscani was getting his hair cut at a barbershop near Kent and 27th. Halfway through, a man in a ski mask pops out of the back room and blows his brains out with a revolver. He runs out the same way he came. There happened to be a plainclothes also waiting for a trim, and he follows the perp out the same way he came in. The bad guy loses the cop on the stairs, but not before it's been called into the station house right down the street. Within three minutes, we've got a squad surrounding the building making sure no one leaves. We start searching the building, and we find a door ajar. Inside, we find the ski mask and the murder weapon on the ground. A moment later, Capaldi comes out of the bathroom naked as a jaybird, says he was taking a shower and doesn't know anything at all, says someone must have broken into the apartment while he was in there, ditched the gun and the mask, and also happened to steal all his clothes. It's possible, isn't it? Possible, yes. But Capaldi doesn't live in that apartment, and he hasn't been willing to share any particularly compelling reason he was in there to begin with, or why he was conveniently taking a shower which cleaned off any traces of gunshot residue. How about a non-compelling reason? Says he got a call telling him there was a medical thing. He said he thought it was black market organs. They wanted him to meet up at the apartment and shower and change clothes to avoid any kind of contamination. There was a change of clothes on the bed, and he swears it was there when he arrived. More interestingly, there was a wood stove in one of the other rooms of the apartment, and we found fiber traces. He must have burned the clothes used during the shooting. Well, the shooter did, and they burned up their own clothes, took Smitty's, and left him with a change of clothes to make the whole thing look like that was the plan all along. So, who does live in that apartment? If anyone at all has lived there in the past ten years, we can't find them. It used to belong to a sweet old lady, whose children have all done time for activities related to organized crime. So unless I miss my guess, it's become a mob safe house? You don't say. I do say. And what do you say, Detective Grayson? Say? In order for me to say anything, we would have to be having a conversation. And we are most definitely not having a conversation. We're not. Not unless you want to be busted back down to traffic duty, Sergeant. I had a lot more questions, but Grayson was understandably not forthcoming with answers. To be honest, she'd stuck her neck out way further than I had any right to expect. Still, it wasn't enough. The cops had found Capaldi in a place where he shouldn't have been. To their way of thinking, that meant he was likely doing something he shouldn't have been doing. It might not have been foolproof logic, but it was one of those things which was true more often than it wasn't. Then again, just because he was doing something he wasn't supposed to, it didn't follow that that something in question was murder. I had a handful of options in the next steps department, and I decided my best bet was a conversation with some fine upstanding folks who could possibly tell me what Capaldi was actually doing in that apartment. Or maybe they could not. Or maybe they could, but would find it suspicious for me to be asking. The last part was dangerous, because when these people found something to be suspicious, their every instinct was then to make that whatever it was not be at all. Ladies, please excuse the intrusion. Would it be overly forward of me to ask to buy your lunch and bend your ear for a few minutes? Jack McCoy, private eye. That's what it says in the intro. We don't get to have lunch with a Boy Scout that often. Have a seat. Thank you. Though you might be overselling my moral character there. Yeah, she's not. All four of her brothers were Boy Scouts. What brings you by, McCoy? Smitty Capaldi. Smitty? Interesting. His lawyer asked you to poke around? Not as such. I'm working for the family on a provisional basis. Provisional? I thought it might be an area of interest to the two of you, and I didn't want to stick my nose in if it wasn't welcome. (laughs) Based on your reputation, McCoy, I'm guessing it's more accurate to say you want to see if your nose is welcome, so you can sneak around if we say no. That depends on how strenuous the no is. If it's a, eh, we'd rather you didn't, I might be tempted to ask forgiveness later. If it's more of a Jack McCoy, never heard of him, officer. 
Shame about what happened, kind of thing. That's a different story. Trustworthy. See? I told you he was a Boy Scout, Angela. I appreciate the honesty. What are you hoping to find? In a perfect world, I would find proof that Capaldi didn't kill Sal Toscani. That doesn't offend my sensibilities. How about you, Julie? I'm good with it. Smitty never seemed like a killer to me. I don't like him for it either. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. Of course, that's only half of what you gotta do, McCoy. And now I'm less happy and more confused. Yeah, you missed a step. See, the thing is, I like Smitty. He went out with my sister one time. Real gentleman. Not like that bum she married. But... 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 See, it doesn't matter how much I like him. There's still the matter of Sal Toscani. Jerk. Real jerk. Cheated on his wife. Cheated at poker. And he smelled like old pastrami in two-dollar cologne. He was a pimple on the butt cheek of mankind, if you see what I'm saying. May he rest in peace. But... 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 He's family, McCoy. And the problem becomes that someone killed a member of the family, which is not something which can go unanswered. But you don't think Smitty did it? Softy like him? Nah, no way. Doesn't matter, though. Hypothetically, if there was an organization which prided itself on loyalty, and one of their members were to meet a sudden violent end, there would need to be a message sent indicating the unacceptability of such a thing. A very strong message with lots of finality. So even if I can prove Smitty didn't do it, that message still needs to be sent. Hypothetically. And as a matter of preference, I would prefer that such a message were to be sent while Smitty Capaldi is in a cell at the county jail. It would be very unfortunate if we had to send a message at his home. In front of his little girl. So hypothetically, I would need to not only prove Smitty is innocent, but also be able to point to who is guilty of the crime. It's like you're a detective. Okay, so at least I understand the ground rules. Smitty said he was hired on the pretense of doing some medical delivery. Does that sound familiar to either of you? If I had a job like that, Smitty would have been high on my list to do it, but no. It's not a line anyone I know is pursuing at the present time. Medical work is high risk, high reward, but it brings more heat than is warranted at the moment. Now, I was thinking I would just have a salad today. But since you're buying, maybe I'll have the shrimp after all. There are a lot of reasons to dislike organized crime. At the top of my list currently was the fact that I was operating on a strict budget of $500 for this case. And lunch with Angela and Julie cost me $107.63. When those two tell you that you simply have to try the wine, they mean it. It's non-negotiably mandatory. They agreed to spread the word that I was operating under their limited blessing, and they even let me in on Sal Toscani's poker buddy, so one could argue that I got my money's worth. But still, I wasn't going to fill in a positive online review card anytime soon. Knowing that I needed to find the guilty party instead of just proving Smitty was innocent had made my life a whole lot harder especially since the number of people who disliked Sal Toscani was apparently a near-infinite number. I decided I'd dig around in that particular hole a little longer. May I join you for a game, gentlemen? It would be our pleasure, Jack. I'm guessing you know why I'm here? Uh, clearly you're here to play cards. But yeah, Julie called and said you might be stopping by. I'm assuming neither of you want to confess to murdering Sal Toscani? Oh, that would have been sweet. It was the dream. I spent so many nights wondering how I could do it. Steamroller. Feet first so I could hear him scream the whole time. Oh, that's good. Uh, I was always thinking, blowtorch. <sighs> so neither of you are in line to be chief mourner. Sal was a 200-pound sack of garbage. He was also related to half a dozen people who you do not want mad at you. So killing Sal was suicide with a few extra steps. Unless maybe you hired some poor schmo to do it for you? You mean Smitty? How about it? Nope. Too stupid. You mean Smitty's too stupid to pull it off? No, I mean hiring Smitty to whack a guy is too stupid a plan. Yeah. For for one thing, Smitty ain't a hitter, and he never pretended to be one. You don't hire a first-time killer to go after Sal Toscani. For another... Smitty knows how connected Sal was. 
He wouldn't touch a job like that, even if he suddenly became a killer. Uh, 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 also, also, anyone who wanted to kill Sal would have to absolutely done it themselves. It would just be too satisfying to resist. Okay, then let me try another angle. We know that anyone who met Sal hated his guts, may he rest in peace. Can you think of anyone who hated Sal on general principle, but also had it in for Smitty, and wanted to frame him in particular. That was a very significant look you two just shared. Jack, I'm going to deal out some cards. You're going to bet $50, and you're going to lose it. Yeah, and in the meantime, we're going to tell you a very particular kind of story. What kind of story is that? It's the kind of story where you will forget who told it to you. You follow me? You're going to tell me a story, except you're not. I get it. Deal. The worst part of the deal was having to fold when I was dealt a full house. Rico and Tony told me a story which set off every alarm bell in my entire paranoid body. I went home by way of Thompson's Bar and Grill, and I only made use of the first part of the name. Like I said before, there are a million reasons I don't work with kids, but I never told you the biggest one, dear listener. I'm good at what I do, but the best private investigator in the world delivers more bad news than good to his clients. When said client is young enough to still believe there's a hero coming her way on a white horse, it's about a billion times harder to deliver that bad news. I don't remember stumbling home the few blocks to my apartment or getting into my PJs to sleep that night. I just know the sun came up. It's like that sometimes. Doesn't care how lousy my mood is. The sun's got up to do, and it's going to do it. Some people might find that inspirational. Me, I feel more like the solar system was invented for the express purpose of nagging me into doing what I don't want to. So I had essentially three choices. Give up and tell the crying girl her daddy was never coming home again. This was the worst choice and the one most likely to have me alive at the end of it. Option two was pack my things, leave town, and never come back. Thing is, that book I've been waiting for at the library is supposed to be in next week. If I wasn't going to be here to pick it up, I should at least be dead. So I was left with option three, which was to do the right thing. And to do that and still be breathing at the end of it meant I had to get awfully creative and unbelievably lucky at the same time. Mrs. Toscani, Jack McCoy is here. Are you up to seeing him? Of course. He's not alone. Has he brought Sergeant O'Hanlon with him? No, I'd have led with that, ma'am. This is something else. Well, now I have to see it. Good morning, Mrs. Toscani. Thank you for allowing me to come see you and express my heartfelt condolences on the passing of your husband. That's very kind of you, Mr. McCoy. And who is this lovely young lady you've brought with you? Oh, I'm sorry. This is Carrie Capaldi. She's the daughter of the man currently under arrest for the murder of your late husband. Hello. Well, this is... I mean... My apologies. I honestly didn't expect that you'd need an introduction, given that she's your daughter and all. In case you were wondering, Mrs. Toscani, yes, that was too long a pause for you to deny it. You want me to get this bum out of here? No. No, thank you. To erase any question about how much I know, let me paint the picture a little. You were young and foolish with a man named Smitty Capaldi. Maybe it was love, maybe it wasn't. What is, for absolute certain is that he wasn't good enough for the daughter of the Milani family. But Smitty's a good guy at heart. He took in Carrie after she was born and agreed to never tell a soul about who her mother really was. There were only a handful of people who ever knew anything, and no, I'm not going to tell you which of them told me. Sounds like a challenge. You can call the gorilla off, Mrs. Toscani Nimalani. Carrie and I didn't come here for a fight. You got a funny way of showing it. I'm not talking to you, no-neck. 
Mrs. T, I'm sure you're thinking of every way I might try to use this information to manipulate or blackmail or what have you. But I assume you know my reputation. I'm not that stupid. When you're up against a grizzly bear, you don't throw a punch no matter how tough you think you are. Like I said, I'm not here for a fight. What do you want, Mr. McCoy? Let me finish my story. My guess is that after a few years of your childless, loveless, and probably joyless marriage to Sal Toscani, you reached out to Smitty about seeing your daughter, being a part of her life. But Smitty wanted her as far away from all that as possible. It was the best possible decision, and on some level, you know that. But it was also the reason you hated him. And speaking of hating someone, you also had Sal Toscani in your life. I've been told that everyone who ever met Sal wanted to kill him. And you were married to the jerk. So when it came time to rid yourself of Sal Toscani, you figured you'd deal with Smitty at the same time. She don't have to listen to this. You know, I'm trying to figure out if Mr. Atlas over here was the guy in the ski mask, or if he just knew about it. I'm going with the latter, since I figure you'd be pretty miserable if you didn't put the bullet in Sal yourself. All right, that's it. Enough. Mr. McCoy? I will only ask this question one more time. What do you want? Carrie? I want my dad back. Like I said, we're not here to fight. We just came to ask a favor. Your daughter came here to ask you for something. I figure there's enough missed birthdays and Christmases in the past that you might want to swing this one. What exactly did you have in mind? Get Smitty an alibi. If you want to confess to the police, that would be fine with me. But I'm sure you can hire someone to give just enough reasonable doubt to make the D.A. not want to take this to court. There's no physical evidence linking Smitty to the crime, so it really won't be that hard. That's number one. And number two? If you could go and have tea with Angela and Julie sometime this week and drop the idea that everyone who needs to be handled in this matter has been dealt with, I would appreciate it. It might start a rumor that you killed Sal yourself, but given how well-connected you were even before you got married, not to mention how much everyone hated Sal, I think you'll be okay. And that's all you want? All due respect, Mrs. T., but don't ask me. Ask my client. Two days later, the gorilla confessed to the murder on a video and boarded a plane to an extradition-free country about an hour before he sent it to the cops. I still don't believe he was the killer, but honestly, I've got enough problems. So it's not the platonic ideal of a happy ending. The murderer didn't go to jail, and Carrie learned that her mother abandoned her at birth, was involved in killing a man, and tried to frame her father. And not to belabor the point, but when you look at the money I was left with for this job, I didn't exactly come out on top myself, especially when you consider the last two expenses. Jack! It's open, Ethel. Do you want to tell me what this is? Just sign it, Ethel. I already paid for it, but since you're the landowner, you need to authorize it. You hired an exterminator? No, I hired a relocator. He's going to catch the raccoons and live traps and drive them out to the country as humanely as possible. I'm sure they will be eaten by a passing hawk within a week or so. I was going to take care of this myself. And I did not particularly want to see you arrested when you did so. Really? I don't exactly believe it either, but there you go. And since I know you wanted the satisfaction of putting the critters down yourself, I thought I might just give you a surrogate. Ooh! A coonskin cap! I always wanted one of these when I was a kid. Entirely synthetic. But if you want to take it down to the shooting range and fill it full of holes, I'm sure they can arrange it. So... Do we have to do something like be nice to each other now? Good Lord, I hope not, Ethel. And so ends another thrilling adventure. A private eye might not exactly be Santa Claus, but for one little girl, Christmas came early this year thanks to the efforts of Jack McCoy, Private Eye. You've been listening to Jack McCoy, Private Eye, The Young and the Reckless Endangerment, produced by Seat of Our Pants Players, written and directed by Dan Wenzel. Jack was Rick Tennant. The announcer and the bodyguard were Andrew Dell. Ethel was Jill Wenzel. Carrie was Morgan Gastingy. Sergeant O'Hanlon was Dan Wenzel. 
Detective Grayson was Rebecca Scheiber. Angela was Brianna Kuby. Julie was Liz Music. Rika was Aaron Manka White. Tony was Adam Gastingy. And Mrs. Toscani was Andy Gastingy. Fast Talking by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0. Other music and sound effects by www.freesfx.co.uk. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you later. Special thanks to our Patreon supporters, including Kimberly Hawkins, who now supports us at the Founder of the Feast level. Thank you, Kimberly. Check out patreon.com slash seatofourpantsplayers to find out how you, too, can support this little band of friends.